Good evening, everybody. Uh, Romans 6. Romans 6, I'll begin in 10. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you shall obey it in the lust thereof. Now, Lord, we thank you for everything, and we just ask that you just come down, and you know how we all have different struggles physically. Some are tired, some are overwhelmed. We could go on and on. We're living in some interesting times, but Lord, we know you're in control, and we pray that you meet us and you encourage us, that you prepare us to receive what you have for us to do for us today, and we just praise you for everything, and we say this in your name. Now, you know, we've been uh, considering what we have in Christ. Uh, I think that's the biggest problem. I think the two biggest problems in the Christian church is that people don't know who they're in Christ. And the second thing is they don't know what they believe. And a lot of times they walk in unbelief. And I talked about that this morning. Uh, as a result, we are not overcoming Christians as we look at what Paul is trying to show us in chapter 6, it's in Jesus' death we are identified to true life. And without that uh, reality of his death and being identified to that, we really cannot be identified to his life. It's in his life we are assured of resurrection of a new body into his glory. And so that's where our assurance is. And we talk about death, and of course, that's contrary to the world. Physical death is, thing, is, is what the world tells us to flee from. You shouldn't desire it. But the reality of it is that this body is the only thing standing between you and eternity. And when this body finally goes, it, your spirit is going to either go and be with the Lord in his presence, or it's going to go to hell. Of course, we're talking about the spirit and soul. Now, you know, I often become upset with myself because I have it all in Christ, and yet there's many times I act like I'm spiritually bankrupt. I act like I have nothing going for me. That, you know, this, this life in Christ is a burden or it's not, it's not um, sufficient enough, it's not satisfying enough it's not all these things and so it's it's a tendency of people to look elsewhere instead of in their life in Christ and that's what's going to get them in trouble because that's going to take them on detours and they're going to end up at the same dead end in their Christian life I know I did for the first seven years I mean I looked to everything and everybody except Christ and I actually did end up spiritually bankrupt. And, but the, when the Lord brought me to the end of myself, that's when I was broken. And that's when I was broken at my pride. And that's when I began to realize what I, what I was missing in Christ. And, you know, if we could see what we're missing in Christ, it would break our hearts. It would break our hearts. And, and we would say, why, why did I, it was just right there, why didn't I do it? And a lot of times we don't do it because we still are too much attached to the world to do it. And that's why the Bible talks about setting your affection on things above. Now you have to realize that Jesus gave up the riches of heaven, and that says so in 2 Corinthians 8 9. He became poor for us so we could be made rich. In what? In our faith. That's what James 2.5 talks about. Jesus stood as a lamb before the world, a blasphemer before the religious people, a fool before a dark world while he hung on the cross. That's what he did for us. He did this all so we could be what? Rich in faith. Not rich in the things of this world, but rich in that which is eternal. 
Yes, I'm regarded at times as a spectacle when exercising my faith. Uh, we've heard it all when we've exercised our faith. People say, are you sure you heard from God about that? Because it wasn't happening the way they thought. And I thought, yeah, I heard, we heard, we prayed about, we trust God spoke to us. And we're going to hold on to it. I didn't realize at the time it wasn't our faith being tested, it was theirs. And we, they were looking at us as a spectacle because it wasn't happening the way they thought. And I, I said, Lord, I don't want to share this with anybody because it's like casting your pearls before swine, nothing personal. He says, no, you put, the, you put the witness out there first that you have prayed about and I told you this and the rest of it, you follow it and if they look at you stupid or whatever they look at you, you keep on staying the course. You don't say anything else to them, but stay the course and I'll show it. I'll show them that you have nothing to be ashamed because you put your faith in me. And so it's been a challenge at times uh, walking by faith. Uh, I, we have been mocked at other times when uh, we were not willing to give way to the world, to the world's design. We've been mocked. You know, I had a, a, a pastor woman say, go out there and date somebody just so you don't look uh, like you're strange or you're a lesbian. I said, what? I'm not going to do that. If they don't have enough discernment, they're going to believe what they're going to believe anyway. And so there's always this, this attempt of people of the world to try to get you to fit into their religious ideas. And guess what? You're never going to. Also, you get mocked when you, when, uh, you will not surrender to the wicked powers and ways of this age. You're going to be mocked and put down that for that. You know, I can't tell you how many, and I, I'm here to tell you, the people that have been the worst towards us are people in the so-called church or religious system. They're the worst. Because we have not fit. You know, I tell people we have failed three tests up front. One is we're women. Nothing personal, it's just the way it is. Number two, we're divorced. And number three, we're women. And you, you can't get around that. And you know, I've struggled with the Lord. I said, Lord, you know, you give, me, you give me these callings and things, and then you made me a woman? He said, Rael, uh, I'm using your womanhood to refine you. Doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It's who you allow yourself to become, to know that it's through your womanhood that I channel your gifts in a certain way. I couldn't do that through a man. I have different ways in which I channel the gifts. And the different uh, purposes behind their gifts, well, behind my gift, it's a big testing to most people. Behind the, the, the test of a man, it is to maintain that authority and integrity at all times. So it's a different test according to your gender. And you accept that and you realize that God's just using it, period. And it's okay. He didn't make a mistake when he made me. He really didn't. I questioned him a few times, but he really didn't. Now... Satan harasses me at times because I'm weary and uh, I'm ever failing to line up to the one, okay, who has secured victory for me on that old rugged cross. I never quite make the grade. If I do, you know what I know? I'm going to be knocked down within a matter of seconds. Because, you know, when you're really walking this world, you have to walk through the valleys of humiliations all the time. And you just better get used to it. And you're going to embarrass yourself. You're going to look like a fool. You're going to look like the spectacle. You're going to, you're going to blow it. And they're going to say you're a hypocrite. And, I mean, you're going to hear it all. But you see, as long as you're true to the Lord, you're true to yourself, you take your humanness to God and you're honest about it. 
he will deal with it. He will use it. And that's what I've had to come to truth with. Now, the truth is, even though I have my struggles, it's because I'm identified in Christ in his death, through his burial, and with his life. I am identified personally. I'm identified in Christ in his death, through his burial, <coughs> and with his life. Excuse me. I am identified with him in his life that I am positionally seated in high places because of who I am in Christ. I'm seated in high places with him. Now, it's hard to believe that when you're walking in low places. But we are. we got to have that vision of who we are in Christ. Ephesians 2.6 tells us that. Now, yes, I can act as if I only walk in the lowest base places of defeat at times. I find myself overwhelmed by the happenings of the world. I think a lot of people are. But people, you have been placed in high places so you're above the judgment of the world so that God can give you his perspective. Now, you're not going to understand everything. You're not going to understand everything. But by faith, you can know who you are in Christ. And that in due time, you're going to realize that he has brought you up into that arena where you do have his perspective of things. Right now, there's so much going on. And since we're not God and all-knowing, we can't keep up with it. Now, we make our best guesses based on scripture. Most of the time, we're wrong, okay? I admit it. But there are things I cannot get around because of what Scripture says, too. And I say, I see this happening. Now, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't line up to my theology. But throw my theology out the door. It lines up to Scripture. And that's what's important. Now, I know in spite of being overwhelmed that I, that I can be lifted up at any time by the R of the magnificence of our God. We have to look up. We have to choose to remember who our God is. And when we do, the world loses its power. Because the magnificence of God is so incredible. It brings awe to you. But you got to look up. you got to remember who he is. You've got to know that your perspective stinks. You can't trust it. But you can trust his. But guess what? He can only impart so much to you. Because it would totally destroy you. It would destroy you. If you knew everything, it would destroy you. So he only gives you bits and pieces. And guess what? He has to even enlarge you on that. Because it would take you down. He has to enlarge you to prepare you to even receive small glimpses into his glory. Or into what's going on. And people say, I want to know, I want to know. I like, no you don't. You can handle it. You see, God is God. He knows it all. You eat, we don't. We're not meant to be. We're meant to trust him with the unknown, to trust him in his sovereignty. Now, in the first part of Romans, the Apostle Paul went after people's foundation, he, their understanding about God, their philosophies, their theology. He ripped at every point of delusion about man that we can have. He is ungodly, as Paul points out. He's a sinner who broke the law of God. He's also the enemy of God. And all who remain on the wrong side of God is hopeless and doomed. There's no hope for them. Paul really wanted them to get that understanding. Now, walking in darkness, preferring darkness, and seeking to hide in the shadows 
is how man keeps from facing the light of God. That light that he so much fears because it will expose him. It will show him the darkness in his soul. See, on the road to Damascus, what Paul saw was the darkness of his soul. He was blinded by the light because his soul was so dark. It was a physical blinding, but there was also a spiritual uh, reality in all of that. And that's the way we are. We often hide in the shadows to expose the exposure of the light. Now, man often, man either walks away from God scoffing, or he flees from him to hide, or he dances in the shadows with excuses, all to avoid that darkness of his soul from being exposed, all to avoid, and here it comes, people, true repentance. You know what keeps you from true repentance? Your pride. Your pride keeps you from true repentance. And true repentance ends in brokenness, and pride will not allow itself to be broken. So when you get to the Christian life, it's not for the half-hearted, it's not for the compliant, it's not for the whiner, it's not for the fickle, and it's not for the lazy. There are those, though, who must always control the narrative so that they will come out looking and feeling a certain way. Christianity is never about you coming out with anything of importance. Your importance is God in you. That's your importance. Anything outside of God is vain, it's useless, and if you seek glory for it, that's the only glory you're going to get. That's the only glory you're going to get in this lifetime. And the Bible tells us that. You seek the glory down here, you get the glory, that's your only glory. Because it has nothing to do with heaven. Because the only one that deserves glory is God. And he will not, serve, he will not share his glory with anybody. And so he's very, very, uh, he's very clear about that. So what needs to happen is to become humble before God, open to his leading, willing to follow and always obedient to his word. So in Romans 6, Paul is explaining why Christ's life proves overcoming. You see, let me put it this way. You will never overcome anything. It's only your life in Christ that's going to make you an overcomer. You can use your best personality, your greatest strength, and all your abilities, and you will never overcome. You will never overcome the flesh. You will never overcome uh, the world. You will never overcome Satan. It's only as you become more and more dead in Christ and alive unto God will you really become an overcomer in the kingdom of God. And that's the reality of it. So, we have in Romans 6, Paul to explain why Christ's life proves overcoming. It has to do with that total identification in, with, and through Jesus to possess our heavenly treasure. We have no real life outside of Christ. We all know that, but how many of us live it? In all attempts to live our earthly, worldly, fleshly life, will end up proving to be vain and in other, other failure. You, that's all it's going to do is end in failure for you. It's going to end in disillusionment. Your soul's going to be restless. Your spirit's going to be lean. That's what it's going to end in. And we have a tendency when that happens, we close ourselves down even more. We may look elsewhere for other things, but we will never find them. What we do, and I know I've done this. This is why I can talk about it. We tend to convince ourselves we are close enough in our religious life to get into heaven as we selfishly get by in this world while stubbornly 
refusing to really examine our spirit, our attitude, our moods, and our ways. Did you hear what I said? At every point, we are close enough in our religious life to get to heaven as we selfishly cling to this world while stubbornly refusing to really examine our spirit, our attitudes, our moods, and ways. You see, the Bible says examine yourself and see if you're in the faith. Make sure you're not a reprobate. That what you have is not vain, a castaway, and useless. You have to do that. Nobody else can examine you but you. And you ask the Lord, turn on the spotlight and bring me down to my face and show me any wicked way in me. Are you willing to have that light turned on? I'm not always. You know why? Because I'm not really ready to face some of those things. And God has to get me desperate to do it. I hate to say it, but that's how it comes down to it. Now, overcoming for the Christian life is determined by how identified we are in Christ. Whether we are completely submerged into his death, buried with him in the grave so we can be raised up in a new overcoming life. It's all about him. You see, the cross is about you. Please hear me. The cross is about you. You come up to that cross to find forgiveness, to know God's love, to realize that everything he's done for you is grace. But when you become identified with that Christ cross, you do so, so everything in your life becomes about Christ. Not about you. It ceases to be about you. That's why it's talking about complete identification in Christ. It's not about you any longer. It's about him. And so to get us there is not an easy job, but God does the impossible. You know, it's like the men said when he says, you know, the rich are not going to make it in the kingdom of God, you know, in so many words. And they said, ah, who's going to make it into the kingdom of God? And that's when the Lord says, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. We're saved because God does the impossible. And the more I am aware of my wonderful self, the more I realize what an impossible task it was for God to pull me out of the garbage and the crap, to put it mildly, and everything else, some people would say um, worse words, but it's true. And save me. Actually clean me up. Not just outwardly, but inwardly. He still cleaned me up inwardly, and I think, boy, God, sometimes you have an impossible task. Good luck. And, and he says, no, Rail, good luck to you to see if you can avoid it forever. Guess who's going to win, right? The problem is, and this is our problem, is we won't leave the old behind. That's our problem. So that we can be raised in the newness of life and truly become those new creations. It's hard to leave the old behind. We get into habits. We get into attitudes. We get into all these different things. And it's natural. That's the problem. It's natural. The Christian life is contrary to what's natural. And we have to change habits. Oh, it takes 30 days to change habits. Okay. One, I did it. Two, I did it. Three, uh oh, I just gave in my old habit. I mean, it's a constant struggle. Because we have this attitude. We have these rights. We have these reasons. I've done it. I know all about them. And I've had to usually face each one. But then when I would face it, the Lord would say, you know what? This is a symptom. I'm after this, a hard attitude. Well, this, yes, this is a bad habit, but I'm after this in you. And so this is going to drive you crazy until you submit to this. 
So I'm saying, Lord, show me what to submit to, anything. Uncle, uncle, uncle. It's not enough to call uncle. He wants you to face it. Take that journey with him and face it for what it is. So, to become identified with Christ in life, we have to reckon that we are dead with Christ by faith. Reckon. We talk about that term a lot. Now, we're told the reality of Christ's death, the hope of the old season in the grave, and the promise of resurrection is something that we know. It's not something that we hope or we believe. Hope is a future expectation. Knowing is, I know it now. It's true for now. These are things we know. If you truly have believed the message of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, you know these things. But the question is, are you identified with him? Do you believe it enough for yourself? You see, we can say, oh, that's for so-and-so over there. Oh, so-and-so needs to go to the grave. Oh, so-and-so needs to uh, just realize that they have resurrection power. And Oh, so-and-so needs to get over themselves and know they have victory. We have all these platitudes. But you know what? The question is, do you know it? It doesn't matter if so-and-so knows it or not. That's between God and so-and-so. Until you realize that the most important person to God is you and your relationship with him, maybe you'll quit looking to everybody else and face him and say, Lord, when it comes to you and me, I'm the only one you're ready to work on. You're after, I, you're after me. Now I can't figure out why you're not after so, so they have a problem. I can't figure out why, you know, you're not using that person, you want to use that person because they're better. I mean, we can do that to ourselves. But you, you see, Christ was your only focal point on the cross. That's why you're saved. Now, you're his focal point so he can save you. He can save you from yourself. He can save you from this world. He can save you from the claims of sin and death on you so he can save you. So he can deliver you. The question is, are you allowing him to put his finger on those places in your life? Are you ready to face it so you can do something about it? Are you the one that's going to change you? No. God's going to change you. But you have to be willing to face it, come into agreement with, it, with him about it, and say, this is unacceptable in my life. Because it's unacceptable to God. Now, since we know Jesus died for sin once, and the Bible said that, he rose again, that he will never die again. Why? Because, people... Death has no dominion over him. Death has no dominion over him. And guess what? It has no claims on him. Now, how important is that to us? Well, this is how important it is to you. If you are truly in Christ, death doesn't have any dominion over you. If you are truly in Christ, death has no claim on you. You're alive under God in Christ. It doesn't have that. So why are we acting like it has that say over our lives? Why are we acting like that sin and all these things have claims on us when in Christ he rose and left it all behind? And we are in Christ. Now this is a victory we have in Christ, but we must be overcomers, and that involves denying self. Oh, this is where we get involved. <laughs> Do I have to deny self? You know how self feels to me. How about applying our personal cross to our flesh, to ourselves? And here's a big one, obedience. 
Obedience to the word. But obedience to following Christ in his life. Following him in his footsteps. According to his word. According to his example. Now I know you know that this word walk is referred to as discipleship. We have his life in us, but we need to follow him. That's a big one. Follow him to possess the abundance, the inheritance, the promise, and the covenant attached to that life. You see, he's the only one that can lead us into the abundance of his own life. But you have to follow him. You can't get anywhere if you're sitting in a pew or sitting in your chairs with wishful thinking, or saying, tomorrow I'll get real. That's why Paul says, today is the day of salvation or deliverance. Because you know what? There's no tomorrow, there's only today. Because guess what? As someone pointed out, tomorrow will be today. And we'll have the same excuses. I know I do. So this is all about discipleship. What do you think Paul's trying to get into these people's minds? This total identification so that they can truly be a follower of Jesus. He's trying to get this in their mind that it's no longer about them, it's about him. Now it's only as we die to the old that we can live unto God. The concept of unto points to coming under submission to something in order to obtain the goal of something. To see it through. Now you can't live to God until you come under his authority to line up to the call he has for you as far as your life. You see, he gives us a call so we will line up to him for that call to be fulfilled. Because the first call, initial call, is to follow him. And then we learn what our, our calling or our abilities or our talents are along the way. So you can't live to God until you come under his authority. And to come under his authority, you have to reckon or count yourself dead to sin. Oh, wow. You have to go back to that again? Yeah. Because what people are doing is they want to live unto God without dying to self. And as long as you don't die to self, I hate to tell you this, you're going to always end up living unto self. Because self is going to demand an audience with you. Every day of your life, self is going to say, I want an audience with you. And if you're not dead to self, you're going to give self audience. It's natural. So it's that dying out process daily that we really don't want to walk through. That's not fun to go through that dying out process. Certainly hasn't been fun to me. But you have to realize that's the only way you're going to gain his life and your inheritance. It's because unless there's a death, there, you can't take ownership of your inheritance. Now, Christ died so you could have an inheritance, but possess it. You have to, what, die in him to possess that inheritance. Because part of that inheritance is a new life. A new life in Christ. So, Brett, Resurrection does not manifest itself unless there has been a death. And that's how it works. So we have to live the life of Christ unto God if we're going to possess his life and receive our inheritance. Now many people aren't overcomers because guess what? They haven't reckoned that they're dead yet to sin. And the reason they haven't reckoned it is because they haven't reckoned the other part. That they're here for one purpose, to live unto God. You see, a lot of times people aren't willing to die because they don't have any purpose. So I die, what's the purpose? The purpose is so you can live unto God. 
We have to understand the purpose before we're willing to die to self. What are we filling that with? I'm going to live unto God now. So people don't have any vision of living unto God. Because we don't talk about living unto God. We talk about, oh, Christianity, let's have a social club. Let's, oh, it's just a, however they push Christianity. But it's never about living. This is all so you can live unto God for his glory. The vision is not even past this earth. It doesn't even get past the church pew. To realize there's something heavenly out there that is so incredible and we're missing it. Paul is challenging the Romans to understand this. They're not there. And you have to remember about the Romans. If you study the time of Romans... During Paul. And you just put down facts, it sounds just like America. It does. You see, Paul knew that for the Romans, it wasn't dying for Christ necessarily, even though that was required. It was living unto God. Because they had so much of the attraction of the world around them. Entertainment. You name it, they had it all. And so, if you, if you look at it, and this is the same that happened to us, the way that the, the Caesars got votes was the promise greater entertainment. That's how they got votes. They promised them greater entertainment. They promised them greater arenas. They promised them all this stuff. You can read it. We have the same thing in America. Only they didn't have COVID-19. That took all that away from them. You know, God put his fish right in the middle of our idols. To try to get us to realize what's important. And you know, after a year, you know what people realize about their idols? They don't need it. They don't need it. We don't need our idols. So you have to remember that. So he's trying to get through their mind what their purpose in this world is. It's eternal. It's, in, it's, it's glorious, okay? We have to live the life of Christ unto God if we are going to possess his life and receive our inheritance. It's that simple. And so many people aren't overcomers because they have not died to self to gain the vision of what it means to live unto God. Now, you can only do this through Christ, who's our place of life, our truth, our authority, our strength, and our hope. That's who Christ is to us. So let's look at verse 12. And I read this. But it says, Let not sin, therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. It says, let not sin therefore reign in your body, your physical body, your dying body. Don't, don't let it reign. Now letting here, this word letting points to us disciplining ourselves. Again, we determine who reigns in our life. The flesh, the world, or Satan reigns. And know that they reign through iniquity, transgression, in action, omission of righteousness. That's how they reign. They reign in unbelief. They reign in disobedience. I should say reign through disobedience. Obedience to Christ comes out of love. That ensures us that God is reigning over our lives. Now please hear this. God is is reigning over your lives. Christ reigns through your lives with his life. And the Holy Spirit reigns in our lives with his power and presence. That's the Godhead reigning in your life. The Father reigns over you. The life of Christ reigns through you. The presence and power of the Holy Spirit reigns in you. It's the full leadership 
of the Godhead in our lives. And there should be no reason why we're not overcoming sin, except that God is not reigning. Now, a lot of people accept God reigning over their lives because of love. And some will say, oh, yes, Christ's life is in me, but is it reigning through you? And then the one that they really have a problem with, oh, is the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit reigning in their life. Because that means submission to the Holy Spirit in every area. That's a hard one. So I can't let God reign in my life until I count myself dead to my former life. Now notice how if you let sin reign, then you will be obeying the lust of the flesh. That's what it comes down to. If you let sin reign, it's basically you are letting the lust of the flesh control you, dictate to you, direct in you. That's what you're allowing. And Paul's bringing that out. Now, whether we give in to personal preferences, feelings, desires, and imaginations, we are giving in to the lust of the flesh. We're giving into it some way. However, there's more to not letting sin reign by giving, uh, by not giving into the lust of the flesh. And the Bible tells us what to do with our imaginations, with our thoughts. It tells us what to do with the flesh. It tells us what to do with our desires. It tells us what to do. Read your Bible. It tells you. It'll tell you what to do with any problem you have. You have to believe it, though. <coughs> right? You have to believe it. Now, the attitude behind the lust of the flesh is that of selfishness that demands, I will have life on my terms. And there's that song, I'll do it my way. Good luck. However, there is more than that. Let's look at verse 13. It says, neither yield you, your members, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as these that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments, as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness of, unto God. Now, the thing that always amazed me, because I would sometimes say, God, you know, being a woman is really... Challenging, and he would say, Rayola, there's no genders when it comes to vessels and instruments. There's no gender. You're my vessel, you're my instrument. The question is, will you let me use you the way I want to? Will you let me use you as a vessel of honor? Will you let me use you as an instrument? If so, you're going to have to submit yourself to that. You're going to have to yield, give way to that. So Paul is, part, is, is putting forth here, you can't yield your body, even parts of it. I want you to think about that. Because, oh, God can have this part, but you know what? This is my part. Well, God can have this little room here, but this is my little corner. I'm going to tell you, anytime you claim rights to any part of your life, you're going to be eventually used as an instrument of unrighteousness. That's why the Bible talks about total consecration, total death, total identification. You can't yield this part of yourself, whether it's your mind, feelings, desires, etc., as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, and expect to have any real testimony in your life. You know what the testimony is about? Well, it's about salvation, Christ saved me, but it's about overcoming in Christ. If you listen to a lot of great testimonies, it's because there's a point where the person ceased to be of any importance and let Christ be all in all and 
the miraculous things that happen in that and through that person's life is the testimony. And it's, you know, I tell people, your testimony has to grow, okay? It has to grow. It has to grow from the salvation to, hey, this is what God did in my life for me, and as a result, this is how he manifested himself through my life to others. That's the key. Now, there's that word unto again, and as we stated, un points to coming under something in order to obtain it. But it also means something else. And I want you to understand, it means that, you know, something, you can't be half-hearted, you can't be fickle. <laughs> You can't be silly or cardinal-minded about things if you're really going to yield yourself, if you're going to come under something. We have to have a stick-to attitude. We have to be steadfast. We have to be diligent. We have to be sober. And many times, if something doesn't make us feel good or serve our selfish whims, we fail to ignore our self-serving feelings. And the problem is, if we don't, began to push back all those little feelings, we won't step over ourselves. We won't step, step over self. We won't push out wrong moods out of the way. We won't leave our selfishness in the dust to lament what was without us. And we wonder why we don't overcome so we can do what yield, so we can do what? To yield ourselves to God. That's why you let go, let God, is so you can yield yourself to, to God. Now, the other word that is unto is until. Until it's accomplished. Until this is accomplished. Until this is brought forth. I have to keep on that same route going towards God until it's done. And when it's done, people, you're going to be out of the way. Oh, praise God. But it's getting through that process unto, until it's accomplished. Until we're yielded totally as instruments unto God. No longer instruments of unrighteousness. You see, what, what you have to understand is if you are an instrument of unrighteousness, anything you touch is going to be defiled. God can't use it. Whatever you do, he can't use. It's only his instruments, his instruments, can righteousness be maintained in what he wants to do. So how can we yield ourselves as instruments to God? We can only do it as one who's alive from the dead. You have to be dead and alive unto God to do it. One of the things that we're often missing is that of gratitude. And it's very much so today. We're not very thankful. We can be sentimental about God at times. Oh, let me hear that song. Oh, yes. Oh, God's wonderful. Oh, let me just... Hear that right inspirational speaker. Oh, yes, God, God. Oh, yes, Lord, I love you. I mean, I've, I've seen this, and I've been that way. I'm going to tell you something about sentiment. Okay? It never leads to a thankful heart. Never leads to a thankful heart. We can be sentimental all about God, his son, and what he did, but it never leads to a thankful attitude. What leads to thankfulness is a revelation of God's great cost of his son and Jesus' great price of redemption. That's what leads to thankfulness. To realize we're scarcely saved. We're saved because of God's grace. Now, people take for granted what God did because of his love. We assume things because of his grace, right? And we presume things because his will is to see us saved. 
But you know what? Such attitudes will be void of gratitude towards what God has done. Those who understand God's grace, his great intervention, and they have truly consecrated their lives unto the Lord, knowing they are indeed what? Alive from the dead. They have resurrection power in them because they have the life of Christ in them. And they have been raised from the dead so that they could be alive unto God for his purpose, for his service. Now, there are those who will commit their members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And I hope everybody here is doing that. I can't always say that I have the best uh, whatever. I'm limping along sometimes and saying, God, I don't know how you put up with me. And he says, my grace. We really have no clue how great his grace is sometimes, people. We will be learning it about it for ages to come, his grace. That's how far-reaching it is. But let's read 14. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What a powerful statement. If you're dead in Christ and alive unto God, sin has no dominion over you because it has to do with the law. And we will see that Christ is the fulfilling of the law. It has no right over you because you're now under grace. Now, we are told in this state that we will present our members, in this statement here, as instruments of righteousness unto God. And as a result, sin will have no dominion over us, if that's true. Now, yes, sin's going to come in. It's going to kick us a few times. It's going to rattle our cage. It's going to step on our toes. It's going to do things like that, but it has no dominion over us. In other words, it can't reign over us. If we really have the life of Christ, it's never ever going to be able to take that dominion over us because Christ, we're in Christ and he's the one that holds the keys to death and hell. It has no dominion over us. So, here we have this glorious reality that as a result, sin will not have dominion over us, for we are not under the law anymore. We're under the spirit of the life of Christ in us. We're not under the law of sin and death, but instead, people, again, we come back to this. You have no earning, no say, no anything, or under the grace of God. We are under the grace of God. 